So in part two of this video on Karad Dandar Recti, we are going to take it up at the point that we have already dissected out the internal, uh, the external, and the common carotid artery. Um, we already talked about uh, looking for blue as we uh, dissect on distally and get in control of that. We showed you at the end of uh, part one. And here we are controlling basically the external carotid artery. <coughs> And, you know, at this point in time, this is where we're really going to take this up from. So we now have tapes around the external, the internal, and the common. Um, at this point in time, I tell the anesthesiologist to go ahead and give the heparin. You know, give 100 units per kilo of heparin, and we're going to let it circulate for three minutes. Now, during this time, um, again, I would urge you all to develop your routine. Uh, I do exactly the same thing. Um, I select the shunt. Uh, I judge the size of the shunt just looking at the internal carotid artery, and I always use Nergal shunt. As soon as I pick this up, I take a tool of silk and I wrap it around twice, and I place this two-thirds of the way along that shunt. Um, resident ties uh, or the knot on this. You don't want the knot to narrow the lumen. It's really it's just so that we can actually pull it out at the end of the case. The short end is going to go up the internal carotid artery. The long end is going to go down the common carotid artery. I then cover all the retractors uh, with the towels. The only things on top of the towel are the tapes around the target vessels, and I take my clamps and I put them on those tapes. I put a angled debakey on the tape of the common carotid artery, and I put uh, small uh, profunda clamps, which you'll see on the external and internal carotid tapes. Nothing is clamped at this point in time. And then I check that I've got everything that I need once I start opening the carotid artery. The suction's are working, I use an 11 blade, the pot scissors are all ready and, and all working and the patch is open uh, and prepared at this point. And so questions for you to contemplate then and feel free to stop uh, the video at this point and uh, think about what your clamping sequence is going to be um, and how you're going to open the order. Uh, we use transcranial Doppler on every case that's got windows. Uh, we shunt selectively based upon middle cerebral artery velocities. You may not have this available and so what are your neuromonitoring options going to be? How will you insert a shunt? And how do you know that the shunt is working? And what are you going to do if the shunt's not working? So these are the things that you need to have thought about beforehand and really have a plan. Okay, so here we're going to pick it up at this point in time. Clamp and sequence. I can pull down on the internal and I put that small profunda clamp on. Next, the external is going to be clamped. And uh, next thing we're going to do is pick up on the tape of the common carotid artery. And sometimes I you got to sweep a little bit more of the tissue from behind it, gives me a little bit more length. And avoiding the vagus, you clamp and always clamp proximal to that tape. Now, as regards opening this, open the anterior wall, don't get the back wall. And then take your pot scissors. You should see, you should see blood coming out. No blood, you're not in the lumen. And then it's very important not to spiral around the back of the internal carotid artery as you, as you pick it up. That posterior blade should be fine in the lumen. Sometimes that's easier said than done. And sometimes I'll even switch over to medicine bumps that are a little bit more blunt. I think sometimes tend to find the lumen better. And what I'm looking for is to get beyond that plaque and up into that blue area. Clearly, we are not at that yet. And that's pretty nasty. Although, you know, we put a retractor underneath the skin, pull it back, and they're going to extend the um, arteriotomy uh, up the internal carotid artery. you got to get beyond the plaque, and particularly in this neck where we've got plenty of room to actually continue to go on up this line. Okay, so here we've got the situation where we're, we're getting up there, and uh, we want to get beyond that plaque. And what we're going to do is we got just beyond it in that area, and I'm going to insert the plaque into normal vessel, Clamp comes off and you should see back bleeding. And so I'm passing this up superiorly. And then I'm going to turn my hand around, grab the tape. And the tape is, is more distal to the angle to make it clamp. I'm going to tuck at the end of the shunt inside the artery, pinch the, uh, you can see I'm pinching the tape here. Uh, clamp has come off and then I'm going to position this. And I put the, the, the um, silk right in the middle of that arteriotomy. And at this point in time, I'm now going to use a hemostat to collar this down and to control any bleeding. Sometimes you don't have to put the collar, you know, on, on the distal end of this. <clears throat> and sometimes you do. If there's back bleeding, you may have to put it down. Otherwise, sometimes just pulling it up and snapping the tapes down onto the drapes may be enough to control that. And obviously, uh, we were having a little bit of trouble uh, getting up above, uh, confidently up above where the plaque was. 
and typically I'll put a clip on that or a hemostat just to stop the bleeding. So shunt in, there's red stuff in the shunt, doesn't always mean it's working. How do you know it's working? And what are the steps you're going to do to make sure it's working? Um, again, we use transcranial Doppler and what you want to see here is uh, and both the tapes are um, a little close to the end of the arteriotomy and this is the easiest way to buy a little bit of length and you can do the same thing distally and we'll show that a little and typically here then another tape is passed around I'm going to push down on it while the assistant is actually going to collar that down see how that gives, buys me another centimeter and we're going to do, end up doing the same thing um, at the distal end of the arteriotomy <clears throat> Then we'll take the first tape and collar off, hand it back to the scrub nurse because these are all counted and it's important that she knows where they are. Okay, so here we are checking for flow in the shunt, just making sure there's a good Doppler signal in it. That's the way that you check and make sure the shunt's working. Uh, I typically don't do that because we're using transcranial Doppler and we know whether the shunt is working or not. Okay, so the audio is now open. What is your strategy going to be for starting the end out right to me? How are you going to hand the proximal end? How are you going to handle the external carotid? And how are you going to define the endpoint in the internal carotid artery? And how are you going to evaluate that IC endpoint? Okay. So here we go. We're going to start. Typically, what I do is I look for an area uh, where there's kind of a natural separation or dissection in the wall. I'm going to start from that area. Don't start from two different parts, start from one. And there's nothing real subtle about this. These are fairly long sweeps. You can actually see how this is being developed. Usually I don't go up the internal. I'm going to develop the proximal end first of all. So here you can see, and it's a lot easier without a shunt. That's why we shunt selectively based upon the transcranial Doppler. And so moving the, the ends of the silk out of the way, usually come back the end of the end direct me with a right angle. And I'll pop it through uh, the other side. This usually comes through here pretty easily. And you'll see this in a minute. You can see you're developing that plaque, comes through, then I'll tell this isn't to spread, and then close and go distal with the clamp. And at that point, I'll take a pair of scissors and cut as near flush as I can uh, what the proximal end of that um, endorectomy plaque actually is. So I'm going to cut it off right there. And usually use mats to go around the back side. It doesn't really matter. Sometimes it's just a little bit easier. It gives you a better angle than, uh, for example, the uh, pot scissor does. Anyway, here you can see we're going to completely transect the proximal end and then we'll ignore it. And then we're going to start working up the external carotid artery. And here we can see the shunt has been passed external to it. Uh, we're working up the external. And I'm going to tell the assistant to grab, once we get it freed up as far as we go, the assistant grabs that entire tube with the hemostat. And I'm going to take off that external clamp. He's going to grab that whole tube. I'm going to take off the external clamp. And sometimes we'll actually help him with the clamp. There you go. You're actually using the, the clamp itself to pull back in that atheroma. And it pops out nicely. You'll see it's going to come out of there. If you can go fairly far up the external, you don't have to go that far, but you just take whatever whatever it gives us here. We're actually doing a fairly long end out right at this point in time. And then he's going to pull it out, grab the whole tube. Try not to grab the adventitious at the same time. Pull this out. This should be very brisk black, black bleeding coming from the external. <clears throat> Clamps back in place. Go ahead and pull that out of the external carotid artery. In this case, there's a fair sizable chunk which is going to come out. There you go. Now it comes out. If you want to, you can back bleed it. It'll bleed fairly vigorously. Now, at this point in time, all the traction on that atheroma should be inferiorly towards the feet. So you're pulling it inferiorly and separating it, and that's what you want to see. You want to see it separate off you know, nicely, just like that. Obviously, there's a little strand there which we can grab and take off. Typically, we'll switch over to... Um, using uh, Gerald's at this point in time. Uh, we've cleaned it up and now we're going to put in some tacking stitches and these tacking stitches are done with usually the 7 proline. I put one through the intima and one immediately proximal through the endarterectomy and then tie it up on the external aspect. You usually do it if the arteriotomy is at 12 o'clock. Typically we'll do this at 8 o'clock and 4 o'clock. 
there's a number of ways you can check this endpoint and uh, remove any loose debris which you see up there. So that's the first one's going in, and then we're going to put in the second one again through the atheroma, or which you haven't removed, or I should say the normal endema on the outside. Um, it's a horizontal mattress, and then you're going to take the second one right at the edge of the where the end out right may finishes, and you're going to tie this up on the outside. Mm. So then you cut the questions, what are you going to do? The big debate, patch versus no patch. In my opinion, there is no debate. Patch. You got to think about what patch options are available. Uh, we use bovine pericardial patch. Uh, some people still use saphenous vein. Not sure there's any particular advantage in that. Obviously, in an infected field, there's potentially an advantage. Um, some use Dacron. Some use PTFE. I don't use PTFE because it bleeds like hell. Um, so my distal control tape, you know, as we've seen, is actually too close. And so, you know, what's the easiest way, basically, of moving that? And kind of putting an apical stitch, you see it's right underneath that red rubber uh, collar. And so sometimes you can actually compress the collar. Sometimes you can't get away with that. And so you need to get a little bit more exposure. And we do this in exactly the same way as, as we did proximally. We can actually move. Uh, move the entire tape and collar more distally so you can actually see it. So the suture's in there, and now it's just a matter of running. These are typically going to be, you know, one to two millimeters apart, probably a millimeter, two millimeters on patch. And we're going to start off by sewing through the non endarectomized portion of the carotid. And you can see that's uh, pretty nice uh, the way that we can do that there. And so then you're going to sew uh, all the way up the side of the patch. Stretching the patch out again. It's important that you start looking early uh, to judge the length, uh, because you can see the carotid itself is kind of all kind of curled up a little bit around the uh, shunt that's in there. So you want to just start always making sure that, that you don't have a size mismatch or a length mismatch between bovine pericardial patch and the um, and the carotid artery itself. Okay, and so. Now we're going to start running down the other side. So the these collars sometimes kind of creep down just a little bit um, and encroach upon it. So same idea. Pass another tape, pass another collar, buy yourself another half centimeter distally, and then you can actually see to sew the apex. You really don't want bleeding at the apex. It's one of the more difficult areas to, to actually get to and to see and to actually fix. So if in any doubt, just move the tape and the collar and give you that added um, exposure that you need in order to be able to safely put in these apical stitches. So same thing as we did the proximal end. Now we can take the tape and collar off. And now we're going to see pretty nicely um, where uh, we're going to put in our apical stitches. Once you've done that, pretty easy to actually continue to suture the patch uh, and in the same fashion as you saw at the first side. And so usually we'll run one and a half, round one entire length and then halfway up the remaining length. So we actually take the shunt out of the um, kind of the middle at the common carotid artery level. It's nice and big. I don't have to worry about uh, damaging the internal carotid artery as we take it out. Okay, so now we're going to we're gonna keep sewing in the background. We're going to take the shunt out. And here's the question, how much do you like your anesthesiologist? I like our anesthesiologist. I always warn them when I'm taking the dough to avoid me potentially spraying them with um, blood from the common carotid artery. And uh, now what happens if you take the shunt out, patient shunt dependent, and then you break the suture? And typically you're going to use something like a side biting clamp that you can put on um, where the arteriotomy is not closed so you can actually salvage this, find the ends of the broken suture, and then put in another, another suture. So these are kind of things to be thinking about it. So here we are, the patch has been sewn on three quarters of the way around and now we're actually going to um, actually take uh, the shunt out. So I'll have the uh, angle debakey ready for the common carotid artery. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take the clamp off, the, or the collar off the internal carotid artery and I'm going to, I'm going to put a hemostat usually on the suture so I don't lose it. Mm -hmm and I grab that tape. And so at this point in time, uh, we're gonna release the, it. It's gonna be back bleeding from the internal because it's already been slacked off. I can lift up 
and put the clamp on. So you get that back bleed and that's good, just leave it from the internal. If you want to control it, you can actually pull up on the distal tape and then you're going to go ahead and complete uh, the patch, mm -hmm. uh, closure of the patch. It also shows you if there's any major, major leaks when you've got back bleeding. So you're done, not yet, you know, heparin, um, I reverse all of them. Now I want to, I will stay there and make sure it's dry. I want to see tumbleweeds that's so dry. Drain, I just drain all of them. Again, none of these things are dogma. You just have to get your way, basically, of doing it. And so at this point in time, we've dried it up. Um, while while the, the protamine is reversing the heparin, I'll go ahead and I just put a 10 millimeter JP drain through a separate stab incision inferiorly. Um, try not to nail the external jugular or anything like that when you're putting, putting it in. And here you can see the drain is going to be pulled out really through the middle. Mm -hmm. So drain is going to be uh, put in place. Sew it in with a two on island. Um, what I neglected to do early was talk about the reperfusion sequence. The reperfusion sequence is always X, so I'll keep the internal occluded. I usually do it with a pair of debakies because often I'm back bleeding when I close the patch and you perfuse up through the external. Um, I first of all back bleed through the internal, then I perfuse up through the external for a few beats, and then I slowly release uh, the flow in the internal carotid artery. Again, the reason we're doing this is we're using transcranial Doppler. I can watch the reperfusion take place, and then we look for um, uh, hyperperfusion and dry everything up at this, this point in time, put the JP back in place, and then we're going to close the platysma, and then we're going to close the subcutaneous tissue. Um, a subcuticular stitch is what we put in. Post-stop, we go to the, most go to the PACU, most go to the floor, most go home the next day. If you call the PACU for significant neck swelling, take them back, reverse if they're not reversed, um, and open the neck in the PACU if they happen to be losing the airway. There's important things that we can do. Thank you very much.